Welcome to lecture 21. We're going to talk about path planning and configuration spaces. So let's start off with some of these examples from the previous worksheet. The first one, we've got a robot that can translate and rotate in the plane. Well, its uh, configuration space is going to be R2, so it can have an XY location, and then this S1, which is a unit circle. And if you notice this, R2 cross S1, that's just special Euclidean space of order 2. So that's our rigid body uh, translation and rotation in the plane. This next robot here is a prismatic prismatic robot, so that's configuration space is R2, an XY location for the end effector. And then this planar manipulator with three rotational joints, that's S1 cross S1 cross S1, that is a three-dimensional torus. Now over here we've got this a rotational joint here in a prismatic, so that's going to be S1 cross R. Uh, we've got a rotational, prismatic, and rotational, so that's going to be S1 cross S1 cross R, or that is R cross the two-dimensional torus. And again, these order of these elements doesn't matter for the configuration space. And finally, we've got here three rotational joints. So it's going to be S1 cross S1 continued for six times, or the six-dimensional torus. So these are these configuration spaces. Let's do a few more examples. These are examples from some robots of my past. So here's a, a project that I really enjoyed. It was a, called a plate ball system. So there's a plate that moves underneath with some magnets and some metal spheres on top that would roll. And so those spheres, their orientation could change. So that moves in SO3. And then each of the spheres has an X and a Y. And so that equals five DOFs per sphere, and there were five spheres. However, uh, the, the relative XY positions of the spheres are constrained. So instead of having 25, we really just had uh, three degrees of freedom for the SO3. So five times three plus two for XY. So that gives us 17. This next demonstration that we have, we've got a bunch of RC robots. And these RC robots, this next demo, I had a bunch of RC robots. So each of these RC robots could translate in the plane and rotate. So that is R2 cross S1. And so if you have 12 of these robots, then you get R to the 2 times 12 cross T to the 12. So that's R24 cross uh, T to the 12. Yeah. So now with five disks rolling, if there were no constraints and each one would have an X position, so that would be R5 cross, uh, we've got five disks that can roll, and so that would be S. Uh, 1 cross S1 cross S1 cross S1 cross S1 or R the 5 cross the 5 dimensional torus. However, there's this constraint in there. And this constraint is that they all rule the same distance and so their orientation is really just a function of that. So this is really just R1 because there's this constraint in that system. So there's only one degree of freedom in our configuration space. Now when we have this fluid in a tank, so you've got an infinite uh, number of particles. So if you want to talk about the XY position of every particle of water in a tank, that would be infinite dimension. However, when this is unstable, you know, it all settles down to the bottom of the tank, and so all we care about is the direction of gravity. So the configuration is really just orientation of gravity. Okay, which is going to be in the unit circle, so that's S1, which is equal to the one-dimensional torus. Okay, for these sliding disks that we have, at least on the right side, we've got nine disks and they all have XY positions. So that equals um, R to the 18. Or in general, if you've got N disks, 
it's going to be r to the 2 times n. And then in this demonstration, we've got 100 particles. However, they're quantized. And so when they're quantized, that means that we're not moving in r2. Instead, we are moving, each particle moves in z2, where z is the integers. And now we've got n of these, so with n of these particles, this is z to the 2 times n. Now here's a cool demo of a two-link robot arm. You can draw a path for the robot to follow, and it'll go through that path and cycle through that. What you can also do then is you can add some obstacles. So I'm going to put an obstacle right here that's pretty close to it. I hold my shift key down. There, now we've got these paths, and what we can do now is we can draw a path for a robot to follow. I might say, oh, I want to fit along here. Maybe zoom along this side. Along this one. And you can see as it animates through all those points there. You know, almost touching that red one on each side and zipping around it. So a nice view of what this configuration space, which is just two variables, and then the actual position of the robot in this workspace. I'll provide a link here for a wonderful paper that talks about how you can do some construction of these configuration spaces. And so this is, again, their picture of this two-link robot and how it converts these obstacles, like this little purple triangle, into this 2D configuration space. And then making a path from the initial to the goal position is this dotted line there. But they go on from there, and they also analyze the configuration space just like we did in our previous lecture. So remember, we took our spaces, and then we computed what's called the Minkowski sum, which is this obstacle that corresponds to all the places where the centroid of the robot could be, and just barely touch this obstacle. And then we can do our planning in this configuration space where our robot is represented by just a point. Now there's a cool demo that you can do with the Minkowski sum. I'm going to show you that video now. So here's that demonstration where we've got a circular robot. And so what you could do first is go around and bring it to all of the vertices and trace out the outer radius of the circle. And then connect lines there that are tangent to your other polygons. And continue that as you go around your entire shape. And so we're just tracing out this shape. Now some of these are going to overlap, but that's okay because in the second pass through there, well, as we drag a line across this, we can find all of our intersections. And then we can, this is called a line sweep, and we can just maintain the points that form the boundary of this set. One of the things you notice, there are going to be some voids in there. There's this one void here in the center. Uh, everything else is continuous. So now that sweep is done, and this is our obstacle region. That paper that I gave you, that paper that I gave you a link to, also does some things where they look at configuration spaces of 3D objects. So here is a blue spoon, and it's in a cup that has a little handle. And if you just move this spoon around without rotating it, then this creates an obstacle region that corresponds to this sort of merged cup over here. You see that as the higher you lift the spoon out of the cup, then it sort of, you can see the rim of that cup and how that interacts with it. You can actually bring the spoon in and almost in, nestle it inside the handle. So there's these points over here that correspond to non obstacles, but it has this beautiful, strange, morphed representation in the configuration space. And then that paper goes on and it looks at, well, what happens if we allow our, our object that translates to also rotate? And so remember, we computed the Minkowski sums of these. And so if you take it with a, a Z rotation, that's that first layer of it. And then as you rotate this every 10 degrees, you can recalculate a new one of these configuration spaces. And you see they get these sort of cylinders, these prisms that are rotated as you move through there. And this shows a way that you can sample from that. You can discreetly come up with an approximation of this. And that is pretty cool. And then there's also this gorgeous video that I'll only show you a snippet of. We'll try to watch it in class, where they actually compute the parametric equations for what these shapes look like if your little triangular robot can not only translate, but it can also rotate. So every slice of this, this is the, the theta degree of freedom up and down here. And every slice of these, you can calculate the Minkowski sums 
using the algorithm we showed you there uh, last last lecture. We can also calculate the 3D shapes of those in these smooth parametric curves that have little edges where you move from one vertex to another. And then you can do motion planning in that true space. And so I think this is a, a gorgeous video. We'll watch it in class. The link is right there. Now we can do the same configuration space for the 2D robot and we can play with it. Let me show you an animation of that. When the robot rotates about one of its vertices such that it touches an edge of an obstacle, such a helix appears. Changing the contact point along the obstacle's edge yields congruent copies of that helix and in turn the corresponding contact surface. We can now remove the helices part which correspond to poses of the robot where it encroaches the obstacle. We are then left with the free part of the contact surface. We now come back to the same setting we started with. The configuration point will traverse the purple polygon, which corresponds to the motion through the narrow passage in the workspace, several times. First, here is an overview of the final setting. The polygon goes in a tunnel between the pillars. Here it enters. So here is that robot, and if I say I want to see the obstacle regions in here, I've got a blue circle over here, and I've got an orange one over there. And although this robot, uh, you'll notice that as I move it around here, I can spin, I can spin my second degree of freedom by moving up and down. This is theta 2. Or I can slide from one side to the other using my theta 2. And so although this is a robot that is moving in a three-dimensional space, its configuration is actually just two dimensions, which I think is easier to appreciate as I move this around here. And so these obstacles that I have here, if I slide this blue one a little bit higher, then it's going to completely block out my face space. As you can see, I, it locks me into different sectors of this. And again, this is this 2D face space that I have is really the two-dimensional torus. So this red dashed line actually joins up on this side, and this blue dashed line joins up up here. But I want to show you because this 3D world is actually mapping directly onto this 2D one.